Shalom, everyone. Shabbat Good to be in the house of the Lord today. Are you glad to be in the house of the Lord today? Yes. Come on, let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. He is worthy to be praised. And you know what? God is so good. I, I'm so grateful that me and my wife were able to go to Puebla, Mexico last weekend. Rabbi Eric and Rabbi Sinalia and Mordechai did an amazing job running the service. And it was an amazing word. I got a chance to even watch a little bit of it in Mexico and got the rest when I got back home, once I got back to free Wi-Fi. <laughs> but we celebrated 16 years of marriage, married May 21st, 2005. You can do the math. And thank you for the mazel tov. And it was a truly a blessing to be able to celebrate with my wife. And of course, we took our daughter with us because she'd never been to Mexico. And uh, it was really a great time. She had a lot of fun. The family that took us blessed us completely with the trip. Uh, we probably wouldn't have taken the money. We haven't flown anywhere during the pandemic. But guess what? It was a beautiful thing to have someone just take care of you where you could sit back, relax, unplug, and not worry about driving anywhere. Most trips I take out of town, I have to do the driving. So you need a vacation for, from your vacation, right? Because you just feel like, you know, that you're a little weary and tired afterwards. But it is definitely a blessing to let someone just take care of you. Yeah. And uh, even though I'm of the... Uh, philosophy that you're you're greater when you serve others than when you're served yeah. but you know what Amen. it's more blessed to give than to receive but once you have given god has someone for you to just receive from so they can choose to also be a blessing the way you've been a blessing to them amen, amen. and that's exactly what this couple said rabbi um you have been you and your wife have been such a blessing to us uh, they were a couple that we counseled in, in the first two weeks of them dating, they were ready to call it quits, and we journeyed with them all the way through up to this day. Probably a good, I would say, oh my goodness, we're talking about probably almost as long as I've been married, we've been counseling this couple. And um, it has just been a blessing to see them grow. Now they've got a thriving business, and they're so blessed they even have land in Puebla. I inherited land, and it's like we got to see the property, and it was just a blessing of the Lord. So um, thank you for allowing us to be able to do that. We say Brahim Habaim to all of our first timers in the house. Those that are watching online, let's say welcome. We're glad that you have come. And also, we started this series with the portion of Bemidbar, the book of Numbers, and a series called Overcoming the Wilderness. Overcoming the Wilderness. That was lesson number one. And the message was called specifically The Purpose of the Wilderness. And the purpose of the wilderness. And then we also had Rabbi Eric speak last week on finding the blessing in wasted places. How many enjoyed that message? Yeah. Finding the blessing in wasted places. And then today we're going to talk about our third lesson, the process of being led through your wilderness. And how many know Israel had their wilderness experience? But so do we. We feel like all of last year and before was a wilderness experience, right? We were isolated from each other. The pandemic was like the plagues that came upon Egypt and the plagues they experienced like the snakes and the earth opening up and the different things that came upon them when they were disobedient to God. Makes you wonder how have we been disobedient to God to where we didn't know this was coming because you didn't really have any prophets in the land that was prophesying that a plague was coming. Nobody knew, everybody was prophesying, it's gonna be the best year ever, remember? It was like 2020, it's gonna be an amazing year. Nobody saw it coming, and maybe it was gonna be an amazing year. It was gonna be an amazing year of spiritual growth for churches and congregations and synagogues to get back to what we're really supposed to be all about. We're not supposed to be so hyper-focused on buildings and organizations and empires and big-time evangelists having big ministries with their name in lights. We were supposed to strip it all back and strip it all down to say, it's really about you and I coming together in perfect unity and still worshiping God wherever we're at, even if it's with our own family and our own home. Even if we're single and by ourselves, guess what? With the Lord, you're always in a majority. You've got the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit on your side and his angels that camp around about you. You're never alone. And if you get just one or two believers to join with you, man, what a party you can have. 
Amen. Two or three gathered in his name. David says, oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let's exalt his name together. So we would meet every week with about the uh, three or four of the elders and, and then slowly some of the members of the congregation wanted to help and serve, just setting up the camera and doing things. And then we had Rosh Hashanah and all of a sudden it's like we had a good 20, 30 people show up and we've been doing this ever since. In fact, the enemy has never shut us down. Praise the Lord. We called the mayor, we called the city officials, we, call, we talked to the, the mayor who is in touch with the police department, the fire department. They said, Rabbi, we know you will do it safe and right. Just do social distancing, sanitize, make it easy for the people to build up confidence in, in coming back and eventually people will come back. And then guess what? The world started fighting to get back indoors and some went indoors too soon and they had big breakouts. Thank God we never had a big breakout. And I believe it's because we did it with wisdom and care and concern. And if it wasn't for our online ministry, thank God we can reach many of you that had to watch online. Thank the Lord for the technology of Zoom and Facebook Live and Ecamm Live and all these tools that I've been able to utilize and our team has been able to utilize to still get the word of God, not only to our congregation, but to the whole Facebook world, the whole YouTube world. And be honest, we are now discipling nations like India. We are discipling. Now you say, how are you discipling India? Do you have like a broadcast in India? It's called Facebook, Zoom, and, and YouTube. I literally have Zoom students from India. And some of you know them. They've become your friends. Miriam and Joseph and Vikas. And we have people from Ghana. Ghana, Africa that are watching. People from South Africa, where you know I've been, where they're watching. People in Australia, New Zealand, the Philippines. The Philippines are being thoroughly immersed with this, could it be that God was allowing all of it? That the wilderness leads to a promised land. When we actually forget about what we thought it was about and get back to what the gospel is supposed to be about. Amen. It should be good news for every Jew and every Gentile and every nation and no one should be excluded. It doesn't even matter if they're living for God or not. Tell them anyway. Tell them with love, but tell them. Tell them with compassion, but tell them. Tell them with an open door, even when it's shut. Knock on it and see if it opens back up. If they don't receive you, then shake the dust off your feet and move to the next spot because there's more people to reach. And someone's got to hear this gospel, this good news, and it's got to reach the world. And if God could reveal the gospel to Abraham in advance and carry it down 2,000 gener 2, years to the generation of Yeshua and then another 2,000 years of a generation in our day, then this must be the same truth. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. When did God stop healing? He didn't. I'll tell you one blessing. I shared this as a testimony. I was like, ooh, is that bad news to like share a testimony? Like, you know, because you believe in superstition, you might think that like, you know, some bad ju juju is gonna, gonna get, get on you, right? You know, I said, we've never gotten sick. No one in my household has gotten sick. We even had a sick mother-in-law for nine years until her passing, never got COVID. Not one member of my family in my household, by the grace of God, I don't say that arrogantly, by the grace of God, the blood of the lamb has been on our house. And I've been praying that over your houses. And yes, sometimes people do get COVID, but thank God, no one in our household, not one person has tested positive. It is the grace of God. And I have been here every week. And I'm dancing before the Lord. And I'm not taking grace for granted. I just know that God can lead you through your wilderness. And if he leads us, as we're led from the scriptures in the Torah reading of Bemidbar, Numbers 8, 1 through 12, 16, Zechariah 2, 14 through 4, 7, and 1 Corinthians 10, 6 through 13, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3 has been our theme verse. I believe it's a verse from the Hebrew scriptures that resounds loudly in the gospels. A voice cries out where? In the wilderness. What does that voice say? Prepare the way of Adonai. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley will be lifted up. Every mountain and hill will be made low. The rough ground will be a plain and the rugged terrain smooth. Do you know you could pray that every morning? Lord, I'm going through a valley right now. Lord, you're going to change that valley. That valley is not going to keep me down. You've got to proclaim that over your life. Every single valley in my life will be lifted up. What God will do is he'll lower 
those mountains you can't climb, and he will raise those valleys to where it's level like a road that has a clear path. And I believe that if anything God has been speaking to me about, he said, son, I need to sit you down for a second. He goes, you know, a lot of things that I've taught you over the years, but I need you to not overload the people and their mental capacity. Some of you are tracking with you. They're on that road. Others are barely joined in the running, barely joined in the march. I want you to clear the path for them. I want you to make it easy. Make his yoke easy, his burden light. Don't make it too hard for them. Make it simple. And I know sometimes these Hebrew words go right over your head. And I know sometimes you're like, Rabbi, slow down. So I'm going to learn to slow down, enjoy the ride. As long as you're in that chariot with me, as long as you're on that road with me, we're going to journey together. We're going to get to the place where God wants us. And we're going to learn precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. So the moment I start sharing a, a much, just say, remember, just do this, little, 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 little. Because I need it to be bite-sized portions that you can digest. If I serve you a ribeye, I don't want you to swallow the steak. You will choke. I want you to take one cut little piece at a time. If you have questions, please, I am always open to just help clear that path even more. So you ready to get in the Word of God? Yes. All right. So I would like to take you to a supporting verse this week. Last week we did a supporting verse uh, for prepare the way of the Lord. But this one really spoke to me as I really felt the Holy Spirit wants to lead us. How many have the Holy Spirit in your life? How many been, uh, it, it, you feel the Spirit indwells you and he has filled you with his Spirit? That could be evidence with certain gifts of the Holy Spirit, but you could just know from his presence, Holy Spirit is in your life. That's the key. The, the, the great thing about the Holy Spirit, he's such a gentleman. The Holy Spirit wants to be our guide. He's such a gentleman. He doesn't push anything on us. You know what I've learned about my daughter? The way the Holy Spirit is to me is the way I need to be, my wife needs to be with our daughter. We don't push them. We show them. We encourage them. We clear the path and we walk with them. We grab them by the hand on the toughest of times. We walk with them. Like God walking with Adam in the cool of the day. We walk with him. You know the cool of the day actually is the word spirit. Cool wind. It literally says the ruach, the spirit of the day. Because Adam once walked with the Holy Spirit. And when he sinned, it separated his spirit from God's spirit. And man, our loved ones, our friends, our family members that don't know the Lord, the sad thing is, they don't know this wind. They don't have this cool breeze pushing them like that wonderful fan that's blowing on me right now. Thank you, Christine. When, when we think about this wind of the Holy Spirit, we think about how God wants to help us. He's like encouraging us with that wind, saying, go this way. And we always go the hot way and the dry way and the rugged way. God says, no, I want to clear the path. I want to make it easy. I want my Holy Spirit to just lead you and guide you. And it's like, this is what the Holy Spirit said to me on a prayer walk. I've been here all along. Ask me and I'll give it to you. I'm like, who's talking? <laughs> I heard a voice inside, the Holy Spirit inside of me say, why don't you ask me for more? Amen. I was listening to John 14 through 16 on audio. And I was walking around the block and I was praying for the congregation. And I heard the Holy Spirit when Yeshua said, there's things I want to tell you right now, but I can't tell you. You're not ready for them. But when the helper of the Holy Spirit comes, the Spirit of truth, he will reveal it to you. He'll take up what is mine and show it to you. I think there were things that Yeshua wished he could have shared with the disciples for three and a half years. He couldn't even show it to them. There's things I wanted to show you guys. I want to show you the depth of all this rich heritage the scriptures have. But I realize I can't give it all at once. Even Yeshua himself, he's Lord of, 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 of heaven and earth. All authority and power is given to him. But he says, but even I can't go beyond your capacity. I have to take you one step at a time. So I'll lead you to this point until I die, ascend to heaven. But I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit's going to come, Acts chapter 2. When the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to help you the rest of the way. From that moment on, the disciples were now apostles, sent on assignment by God. How many of you want to go from a disciple to an apostle? I don't mean an apostle like by title. I mean an apostle like by function. Send me, Lord. Wherever you want to send me, use me. It, where, wherever I am, a family reunion, send me to my family member that needs the Lord. 
Send me to the people that are hungry. Send me to the ones that want to eat the word of God like bread and like milk and water to their soul. They're thirsty. They're hungry. Man, a vacation is good for me. <laughs> I feel so refreshed. Let me tell you one thing that I did on this vacation. I didn't do deep study for a sermon. I listened to the word of God, but I wrote. And I wrote, I wrote a whole chapter of my first book. I don't know, I've shared with you, some of you, I'm writing a book on discipleship. Disciple, to do, how to disciple like Yeshua. I wrote a whole chapter on a plane and in a car in the passenger seat of a car. Bumpy road and all. I wrote. Someone says, how'd you get your penmanship so right? I said, you think that's nice writing? Wait till I'm actually sitting on a desk and not sitting in a passenger seat of a car. But I was able to be refreshed. And you know what? I realized I hardly ever just stop and just unplug and just let go. I was like feeling guilty for a minute. Oh, I haven't uploaded some of the videos. I heard the Lord says, there's a time for that. Right now you need to learn how to rest in me. And that's for somebody here today. Learn to rest in me because I'm constantly going and going and going. I gotta be zoom, 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 zoom. <laughs> I'm zooming all the time. I'm, I'm preaching and teaching. I'm in, in a Christian church. I'm in a Messianic synagogue. And, a, and I'm in a Bible college. And I'm this and I'm doing that. And I'm speaking here and speaking there. And like the Lord says, well, let me speak to you. So let me tell you what's kept me sane. My prayer walks. I would love for all of you to just walk around your block, walk in your house, walk... You just got to walk to your kitchen and just pray. I mean, walk to, walk to, walk in your cars, however you travel, just walk with God. Just talk with him. He's such a friend. He walks with me and talks with me along life's merry way. Why? Because he lives, he lives, he lives within my heart. You ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart. I, I want to go to the whole thing. These were my grandmother's favorite songs. These were my, the songs that I grew up learning to harmonize to. These were the songs that became the legacy that was passed on to me when the Bible and the hymnal of my great-grandmother was passed to me with the corners of her favorite hymns bent, saying, honey, these are my favorites. Blessed assurance. <laughs> Come on. Just a closer walk with thee. Yes, yes. These are the songs I grew up with. Then I got around those wild Pentecostals, and they were singing songs like, He set me free, yes, he set me free. He broke the bonds of prison for me. Now I am something, and he set me free. He set me free. And we get that tambourine going. I mean, from the Baptists to the Pentecostals. My grandmother was raised Catholic. My dad was raised Catholic. None of us knew we were Jewish. It was hidden to us because of those Spanish and Italian Jews. But I thank God for the rich heritage that I grew up with. That when I go back to my roots, let me tell you what this weekend did for me. It took me back. I haven't written in a journal. I mean, really written in a journal. I've started journals and not finished them. But I, I wrote 20 pages in a journal nonstop. They, they said, Rabbi, you're so ex inspired. I said, well, I better inspire before I expire. Because <laughs> burnout is real. And I'm going to tell you, mental health is a real issue today. Mental health. It's nothing to joke about. It's no longer the person you want to deem as crazy or mashugana. No, no, no. We're all dealing with some level of mental health issues because of what we've been through the last almost two years. We're barely seeing our way out of this thing. But guess what? There's been underlying issues, not just health, but mental, emotional, spiritual issues that are coming out to the surface. And I encourage all of us, just have a little talk with Yeshua, and he'll make everything all right. Amen? Amen. So Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 13. Let me just show you a couple things in this verse. Nehemiah was rehearsing the history of the Jewish people. He says, to the Lord. He says, Lord, you descended on Mount Sinai. Where did he descend on Mount Sinai? What did he give us? He gave us the Torah. He gave us those ten words of the Ten Commandments. He descended on Mount Sinai. He spoke to them. Where did he speak from? Heaven. You gave them judgments. Reliable laws. I love this version. Reliable laws. Good statutes and mitzvot. 
He says, you made known to them your holy Shabbat. What's Shabbat for? Rest. To refresh, to restart, to reboot. He says, you gave us that like a gift. You gave us the Torah as a gift. You gave us Shabbat as a gift. He says, and the Mitzvot and statutes and the Torah by the hand of your servant Moses, you gave them bread for, from heaven, the one they complained about, for their hunger and brought them water from the rock. Wow, the one he struck once, at least in the beginning of the ministry. And water came out, and it was for their thirst. You told them to go in and possess the land that you had sworn to give them, but they, our ancestors, became arrogant. They stiffened their necks and did not obey your mitzvot. Verse 19 says, yet in your great compassion. Aren't you glad that even when we're rebellious, God is compassionate. We call him Av Harakamim, Father of Compassion. When you say our Father is in heaven, Avinu Malkeinu, Shabbat Shemayim, Av Harakamim, you call your father? See, I've learned that my compassion to my daughter has got to be greater than my concern. Wow, that's a tweet right there. My compassion as a father has to be greater than my concern. My concern might make me raise my voice or yell or scream or get frustrated or mad if I don't see the right grade that I want to see. I'm paying for a good education for you, girl. What an opportunity. Don't squander it. So I want my daughter to be what? That doctor, that lawyer? Even if she wants to be a fashionista, I don't care. Just, just get some good grades. I just, but you know what? These are the most challenging years for a teenager. She's going to be 13 in July. I'll be 52 and she's 13. I got a lot of running around to do. Chasing a 13-year-old. But you know what? She's a beautiful girl. But the world wants to see the outward beauty, and they don't want to really invest in the inward beauty. So as a father, I compassionately love her and say, Honey, let's sit down and do your homework together. Let, let, let me learn what you're learning. Tell me what you're learning in Bible class. I mean, I'm blessed she's even in a private school where she can learn the Bible. Public school's not going to teach you that, sadly enough. Might be a history lesson, but it won't be the Bible. So I thank God that he has given us compassion as a father. Now, this is where compassion leads to. You do, he says, you did not abandon them in the wilderness. Do you know God's not going to abandon you in your wilderness? Hallelujah. Someone watching online, God is not going to abandon you when you're going through your personal wilderness. I know it feels like that sometimes. Where is God? Where is our finances? How do we trust God? How do we pay these bills? He says, I won't abandon you. All you have to know is he's your source. And you talk to him. Look what he says. I didn't abandon you in the wilderness. In fact, just you know that I'm there. I gave you a pillar of cloud by day that did not depart from above them and guiding them. Say guiding. Guiding them in the way. He says, nor the pillar of the fire that they had by night, which illuminated them, illuminating the way that they should go. You also gave your good ruach, your good spirit to teach them. He gave us his good spirit, his good ruach, to be our teacher. Even in the old covenant, <laughs> the Holy Spirit was our teacher. Oh, the Holy Spirit came in Acts chapter 2. No, the Holy Spirit's always been there. From creation, from Genesis, he's been there. I shared with someone the other day, he's a silent partner that wants you to acknowledge him. He abides within you. He wants to come upon you, but he wants you to ask. Ask for wisdom, he'll give it to you. As for peace, love, joy, he'll give it to you. The fruit of the Spirit, right there to receive. They're fruits that the Holy Spirit waters our tree to produce. And as branches with fruits. Yeshua is the vine, we're the branches, we're the fruit. On the branch, who are the branches? You and I. Our spirit has fruits, but they're watered by the Holy Spirit, Amen. who provides the water for the sap from the soil to produce the nutrients for the branch and its tree to be fruitful. Amen. Amen? So watch what it says. He's not only guiding us, he's illuminating us with his spirit to teach us. You did not withhold your manna from their mouth. Think of the word of God, the Torah, like manna. Because the same way God rained down manna, he rained down the Torah, right? He rained down the teaching. Moses said, let my teaching come down like rain. So he says, you did not withhold manna from their mouth. You gave them water for their thirst. How many know the living water of the Holy Spirit? It's for your thirst. You need the living water of the Holy Spirit. He says, in verse 21, for 40 years you sustained them in the desert. They lacked what? Nothing. 
Their garments did not wear out and their feet did not swell. Aren't you grateful for that? I mean, you know how many know you walk 40 years in the wilderness, your feet's going to swell. You're going to have some cankles after a while. You're going to like have some issues with circulation. No, no, not with God on your side. Because he supernaturally lifted them. The Ark of the Covenant, when the priests would carry the Ark, they were lifted by the presence of God. They would literally float because the yoke of the Lord is easy and his burden is light. So my first point today is the wilderness requires a guide. If you are in a wilderness, let me see the, those that feel like you've either, either been in a wilderness, you're in a wilderness, or you feel like you're about to go into one. That's all of us. We've either been in a trial, we're in a trial, or we're about to go back into one. Because you're always having seasons, little breaks in between. The tempter always leaves for a little bit, and then he comes back to tempt again later. So you're either in a wilderness, you just come out of one, or you're about to go into one. So whether you're in one or not, you need a guide. If in, the wilderness is going to teach us anything, we need a guide. You'll never make it out of a desert alone. You need a compass. You need a guide. You need a map. You need a tour guide. You'll never make it in Israel without a guide. You'll show up at the wrong place at the wrong time and get some tension from some people that don't like you in their territory. You need the tour guide that calls up and says, okay, um, police, uh, how are we doing over there in, in Nazareth? Oh, not too good today? Okay, we'll, go, uh, we'll take a day off from that. We'll go the other way. It happens. Supposed to go to Nazareth one day? You've got to divert because there might be some propaganda going on, some tension going on, some heat going on between the Palestinians and the Israelis. From the Palestinians sometimes to the Israelis. But nonetheless... We still go, we still experience peace. It's still Jerusalem, the city of peace, because God is our guide, amen? I love what Numbers 10, 29 tells us in reference to that. Uh, that's part of our portion today. Look at this idea of the map and the compass in the picture. It says, one day Moses said to his brother-in-law, Hobab, son of Reuel, the Midianite, we are on our way to the place the Lord promised us. For he said, I will give it to you. So they say, well, come with us and we'll treat you, we'll treat you well. For the Lord has promised wonderful blessings for Israel. How many know God has promised wonderful blessings for Israel? Look at verse 30. But Hobab replied, no, I will not go. I must return to my own land and family. Please don't leave us, Moses pleaded. You know the places in the wilderness where we should camp. Come be our God. Even Moses knew you need someone that knows the land. When I went to Puebla, Mexico, like Cinco de Maya Puebla, I had a personal guide that were friends with us, people we've mentored, people we've counseled in their marriage. I trusted them. Wherever we went, they gave me the best. Guess what? I had the real chalupas, not from Taco Bell. I had the real chalupas, one red, one green, Sauce, right? A little corn tortillas, look like sopes. And, and then there was a little cheese there because there's white on the flag, right? So you have the three colors of the flag, right? Green, white, red. There was no eagle on it, but <laughs> <laughs> normally they put strips of cochinita, a little puerco. Guess what my friends did? They said, don't put any pork on his. <laughs> Why? They're taking care of me. I trust them. They're not going to feed me anything they know I don't eat. There was one restaurant, restaurant, they did chalupas, but they did chicken. Guess what? Showed up on my plate. Chalupas with a little chicken on top. Because he had already checked and found out, now that's not pork, right? It's chicken, right? Yeah, it's pollo. Oh, okay, está bien, está bien. Sigue, sigue. So all of a sudden, because you have a guide, you feel safe. You know, you might be going through a wilderness right now, but as long as you have a guide, you have safe. You have a safety net. You have a safe feeling in your heart because there's a guide. You know what, the, what Yeshua said in Yohanan or John 14, as we've been studying in our Gospel of John series. It says in the first part of the verse, but when the spirit of truth comes, he will what? Guide you into all truth. The only reason wildernesses can be a wonder and a wander and confusion, worrying whether you're going to make it out of that wilderness or not, is you don't know what truth is when you're in the wilderness. Everything lies to you like a mirage. You think you're safe, you're walking, there's a snake ready to bite you. Guess what? You gossip, everything echoes. 
hey, Miriam and Aaron, don't gossip about your brother marrying a Cushite woman, an Ethiopian woman, because it's going to get around. People are going to find out. In fact, God heard you. Things echo in the desert, right? Keep that word echo in mind. Numbers 1032. If you do, we will share with you all the blessings the Lord gives us. Notice the rainbow here in this picture of Israel. This road in Israel. There's a rainbow there because it's a picture of God's promise. He says, if you do, we will share with you all the blessings the Lord gives us. They marched for three days after leaving the mountain of the Lord. Notice the mountain of the Lord, Sinai. With the ark of the Lord's covenant moving ahead of them to show them where to stop and rest. What is Shabbat about? Rest. Why do you give us the Shabbat? To rest. And then when we rest, we eat. What do we eat? The word. Right? What do we drink? The water. And if you're good, you might even get a glass of wine. <laughs> wine of the Holy Spirit, that is. Verse 34, it says, As they moved on each day, the cloud of the Lord hovered over them. What did the cloud do? It hovered over them. And wherever the ark set out, Moses would say, Come on, our tour service. Arise, O Lord. Let your enemies be scattered. Let them flee from before you, literally before your face. And it says, when the ark was set down, he would say, return, O Lord, to the countless thousands of Israel. That's what we're praying right now. Return, O Lord, to the countless thousands, actually millions of Israelites, some that don't even know that they're Israelites, some that don't even know they're a part of the Jewish people, some that don't even know in some way they're connected to the Jewish people. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 1. It rehearses this cloud. It says, For I do not want you to be ignorant, brothers. We'll be good. I do not want you to be ignorant, brothers. It says, We were all under the cloud and passed through the sea, and they were all immersed into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Now think about this. This is what we call a Kalve Homer comparison. The way Israel was immersed or baptized into Moses we are immersed or baptized into Messiah. There's a type and shadow going on. They were immersed into Moses, into his leadership, into his guidance, into his advice, into his instruction, the way the disciples were immersed into Yeshua, into his teaching, into his leadership, into his guidance, into his instruction. Amen? It's a type and shadow. We don't contrast before we compare. And that's called kal uh, light to heavy. Kal is light, homer is heavy. Uh, we also see Psalm 23, verse 1, that we looked at two weeks ago. It's a psalm of David. Look what it says, that the Lord is our shepherd, Adonai. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He's what? He what? He leads me. Where does he lead me? Like by still waters. Why? I need to drink and quench my thirst. Look at Exodus 15, 12. Moses led Israel onward from the Sea of Reeds. And they went out into the wilderness of Shur. They traveled three days in the wilderness and they found no water. It says, you in your loving kindness led the people you have redeemed. You guided them. You led them and you guided them in your strength to your holy habitation, which was the tabernacle. So think about this. God brought them out of Egypt, led them through the, the Sea of Reeds. You know it as the Red Sea. Brought them into the wilderness. They complained that they didn't have water. And the whole time you were showing loving kindness to your redeemed and you guided them to your tabernacle your holy sanctuary so the way god leads us is he guides us and he guides us in his strength therefore you're not doing it on your own strength did you catch that lord it's in your strength we do this amen i look at romans 8 14 for all who are led by the ruach elohim the spirit of god these are sons of god how many are sons of god today or children of god today if you're led by the spirit for you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall again into fear, but rather you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry what? Abba, Father. He's our Father. Remember? A Father in compassion. It says the Ruach himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So now our second point, we have just talked about our first point, the wilderness requires a guide. If we need a guide, then we need someone to lead us. And the wilderness reminds us that we need to be led by the Spirit. How many know we need to be led by the Spirit? Right now? 
I wish there was a prophet in the land that was anointed to or prophesied that there was a pandemic coming. I would have bought a lot of TP and a lot of Clorox wipes and a lot of <laughs> sanitizer and stocked it up in my garage and had a warehouse full. And I would have probably given it to all my friends and family that couldn't afford theirs. But nobody did. Nobody knew. So you need the spirit to lead you and guide you, even when the enemy wants to tempt you. In fact, talking about being led by the spirit, you know, Yeshua was baptized or immersed as our anointed prophet of God. He was anointed like a high priest who's turning age 30. He was anointed as a king, as he, he's immersed to take on his royal robes. And in the mikvah, or gathering of living water that we call Maim Chaim in Hebrew, he was immersed in the Jordan River. Look at Luke 33, uh, 3, verse 21. Now when all the people were immersed, Yeshua also was immersed and while he was praying, heaven was opened and the Ruach HaKodesh came down upon him in bodily form like a dove. And from out of heaven, it says, came a voice. Listen to the voice. You are my son in whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. Right after that happens, look what happens. God affirms, I love you, son. And then here comes the devil. <laughs> but before the devil comes, the spirit comes, because in Luke 4, 1 says, Yeshua was now filled with the Ruach HaKodesh. What was Yeshua? Filled with the Ruach HaKodesh. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. Then he returned to the Jordan, and he was what? Led by the Spirit, the Ruach, in the wilderness. How was Israel led? By the Spirit through Moses. Well, Yeshua is going to actually lead by the Spirit, but he also has to be led himself. So you can't lead by the Spirit until you're led with the Spirit. Did you hear that? You can't lead by the Spirit until you're led with the Spirit. The Spirit has to lead you before you can lead others. Amen? And if Moses needed to be led by the Holy Spirit, right? And you and I need to be led by the Holy Spirit, Yeshua led by the Holy Spirit, he also had to be led. I know he's the Son of God, but he's also the Son of Man. He had to be led in his humanity by the Holy Spirit. Let's look at the Matthew account. Matthew 3.15 says, Yeshua responded, Let it happen now, for in this way it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. He's referring to the righteousness of the Torah, because priests would be immersed in living water. So John yielded to him. After being immersed, meaning baptized, Yeshua rose up out of the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Ruach Elohim, which is the Spirit of God, descending like a what? a dove and coming upon him and behold a voice from the heaven said this is my son whom I love with him I am well pleased so what does it say in the very next chapter verse 1 again Luke, Matthew 4 just like Luke 4 then Yeshua was led by the Ruach or the spirit where into the wilderness to be tempted now when I used to read only Matthew's account and I didn't read Luke's account I forgot something the Lord will never lead you to be tempted in a wilderness without the full empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Because if you look at Luke, it says, Yeshua now filled with the Spirit, returned from the Jordan, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. So the Holy Spirit fills you so that you will be able to overcome the enemy as the tempter. He was tempted by the devil, but he was also filled with the Holy Spirit. And you'll never overcome an enemy without power from another source. Because if you're weak and the enemy tempts you in your weakness, you need the strength of the Holy Spirit, not only to walk through the desert, but to overcome the temptation. Amen? Amen. How many need more of the Holy Spirit in your life? Amen. You need him to lead you and to guide you. Now, I'm not going to uh, belabor this, but I want to show you a couple of verses we looked at two weeks ago. Look at this one. Here are Moses God, through Moses, splits the sea, leads them through, made the waters stand like a wall in Psalm 78, verse 13. By the day, he led them with a cloud, and all night long, they had a fire by night. Verse 15 says, he split the rocks in the wilderness and gave them uh, water to drink, all rehearsing the other passages we already read, like in Nehemiah. It says in verse 16, he brought streams out of a rock and made waters flow down like rivers, yet they added more sinning against him, rebelling against Elion, or the Most High, in the desert. Verse 18 says they put God to the test, even though God had given them water out of a rock. In verse 20, and they had bread, they even had meat. You know, there was a whole quail storm that happened. 
for 30 days. And it's amazing how even though this is exactly how God led them, they still complained. And how, who did he use? He used this guy here in Exodus 3, what? Moses was shepherding the flock for his father-in-law Jethro, and the priest who was the priest of Midian. He led the flock to the far side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. The same guy who could lead a flock of sheep could lead the lost sheep of Israel. He used a person that had the shepherding ability to lead them. They just needed to be led. They just needed to be yielded to the Holy Spirit that was in Moses to be able to do this. Look what it says in Numbers 27, 16, even after Moses. May Adonai, the God of the spirits, Moses said, the spirits of all flesh appoint a man over this community to go out and come in before them and lead them out and bring them so that the people of Adonai will, will not be like sheep without a shepherd. Adonai said to Moses, take Joshua, the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Ruach, the spirit, and lay your hands on him. In other words, in every generation, we need spirit-filled pastors, spirit-filled shepherds, spirit-filled rabbis, spirit-filled leaders. You know what people feel like they haven't had during the pandemic? Spirit-filled pastors, spirit-filled shepherds, spirit-filled rabbis, spirit-filled leaders. I don't just mean the, 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 the ones that speak in tongues. I'm talking about the ones that actually access the power of God to lead the sheep like a shepherd and say, this is what we're going to do. If we can't meet indoors, we'll meet outdoors. We'll go feed the homeless. We'll clothe the naked. We'll do outreach. We'll make phone calls. We'll pray for people. Whatever it is. If they say you can't meet in the building, then be what you're supposed to be outside the walls. Be the church. Be the ecclesia. Be the congregation, the called out assembly. Be the Israel congregation in the wilderness. Wasn't Israel the church, ecclesia, King James? The assembly in the wilderness? But they didn't even have a building. How could they be a church? How could they be a, a synagogue? Before churches and synagogues were even created, Israel was the ecclesia. The called out believers called out of darkness, out of Egypt, to the marvelous light of Sinai to receive the Torah. Isn't that beautiful? That's what God has done. Let me give you a couple of other verses that we uh, looked at, Psalm 68. He says, let the righteous be glad. Watch this. I love this. Verse 6 says, prepare the road for him who rides through the deserts. Who's that? It's Yeshua, whose name is Adonai. He's the Lord. Rejoice before him, a father of orphans, defender of widows, is God in his holy dwelling. Now, technically, the verse is about God, but God sends his son Yeshua to establish his kingdom on earth. So therefore, the one that will ride through the desert will not only be God the Father in the wilderness, but Yeshua when he returns. Verse 7 tells us that it's in a parched, dry land that it happens. When you're dry, that's when the Father shows up. Look at verse 9. The earth shook, the heavens rained, the presence of God, the one of Sinai at the presence of God, the God of Israel. Who do we dance to today? The God of Israel, right? You poured down abundant rain. You sustained your weary inheritance. Look at verse 33. Sing to God the kingdoms of the earth. Sing praises to the Lord, Selah. To him who rides upon the ancient heavens of heavens. Look, he utters his voice, a mighty voice. So now, wait a minute. We, we have our first point, which we know can't get through this wilderness without a guide. So if we're going to have a guide, he better lead us by his spirit, point two, right? And my final point today, oh, you said final point? Yeah, I'm done. Final point is the wilderness reinforces hearing the spirit's voice. And we said that the word wilderness in Numbers 1-1, midbar, is actually of the root devar, devar. We found that the, in the wilderness is the same root as desert wilderness or to speak, devar. Because where does God speak? He speaks a word in your wilderness. He speaks a word in your dry desert. He speaks a word when you don't know what else to do and you're dry and parched and thirsty. That's when God speaks a word because that's when you become hungry for God. When we're not hungry for God, we're not hungry to hear his voice. I love it that uh, Psalm 29, 7, we learned two weeks ago that the voice of Adonai hews out the flames of fire. The voice of Adonai shakes the desert. Adonai shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. It reminds me of a story that you might know of a prophet by the name of not Moses, but Elijah. It talks about the prophet Elijah in 1 Kings 19, 4. Here's Elijah. 
He, he's dry, he's thirsty, he's hungry. He needs a refreshing. Elijah, in verse 4, walked or journeyed for a whole day in the desert or the wilderness. Where did he journey? In the desert, desert, the wilderness. Bemidbar. He sat down under a bush, a juniper or broom tree, and asked to die. Talk about mental health issues. Elijah asked to die. He was suicidal. I have had enough, Lord, he prayed. Let me die. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors, my fathers. That is, he is as good as dead as they are already dead, the expanded Bible version says. So Elijah got up and he ate and he drank. And the food made him strong enough to walk for 40 days and nights. Think about Yeshua, 40 days and nights. Think about Moses, 40 days and nights. Where? To Mount Sinai. Because the same place God revealed himself to Moses is the same place God revealed himself to Elijah. How long did they both fast? 40 days and 40 nights. That's why they could encourage Yeshua on his 40 day and 40 night fast. It says in verse 9, but then it, there Elijah went into a cave and stayed all night. And the Lord spoke to him, it, to his, uh, spoke his word, or the word of the Lord came to him. Where does God speak a word? In your wilderness, in your desert. He spoke a word to him. He says, Elijah, why are you here? Literally, what are you doing? The Lord said to Elijah, go stand in front or before me on the mountain. I will pass by you, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a very strong wind blew until it caused the mountains to fall apart and, and large rocks in, to break in front of or literally uh, tear apart the mountain and shatter the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. So that was powerful, but the Lord says, I'm not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake and the Lord was not in the earthquake. So even though the earthquake was powerful, he wasn't in the earthquake. Verse 12 says, and after the earthquake, there was a fire. Obviously, the Lord's definitely in the fire, right? He should have been in the wind and in the fire, because of Acts chapter 2, right? Fire and the wind. But the Lord was not in the fire. After the fire, there was a quiet, gentle sound, the sound of a gentle whisper or blowing or wind. Not a rushing mighty wind, but a gentle wind. As a brief sound of silence, a still, small voice. In Judaism, we call this the bat kol, literally translated the voice of a daughter. And I know what it's like to have the voice of a daughter. A daughter can make a father bend over backwards, do whatever he needs to do to make his daughter happy. Not to spoil him, but to bless him, encourage him. And this beautiful picture of this little girl speaking to what is probably her father. She's whispering, because when you're close, you don't need to yell. If you're yelling in your home, it's encouragement to get closer. Because when you're close, you don't need to yell and scream. Amen. If you're fighting and bickering, you're not close enough. You should never have to yell when you're in the ear of the one you're speaking to. You don't have to scream at God. Just he that hath an ear, let him hear Watch what it says. Although the bat kol was associated with the voice of God heard within the human realm, the bat kol, or this voice of the daughter, was apprehended in a different way, in a different way to the Spirit of God which spoke through the prophets, meaning the prophetic word that the Spirit gave them. The understanding that the prophets spoke with inspired words of God through the Holy Spirit was prevalent in the first temple times. In the period before the exile, However, an understanding took hold that the days of prophecy were coming to an end. Jeremiah spoke of the succession of prophecy, attributing it, this to the rise of false prophets in Israel. Thus we hear in the Tosefta, Jewish writing, after the death of the last three prophets, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, the Holy Spirit departed from Israel, Ichabod. But the bat kol, the voice of the daughter, was yet heard, meaning the soft whisper of a voice. However, the uh, the Tosefta remarks, the one who wrote the Tosefta is the person named Tosefta, but even so, they made them, speaking of Israel, hear God through an echo. Somebody say, echo, echo, echo. You know how an echo works? It's loud, and then it begins to get softer and softer and softer, until all you're left with is a whisper. 
So what is this whisper? I broke down from the dictionary the word echo. It's a repetition of sound caused by a reflection of sound or waves. As a verb, it's one who closely imitates or repeats another's words, ideas, or acts to restate in support or agreement. I want you to think about the bot kol as the whisper of the Holy Spirit. The echo is there to repeat the sound or closely imitate or repeat another's words. God the Father spoke loudly, but in disobedience even, they could still hear the echo. The echo of his voice, which is the still small voice of the Holy Spirit. What's the Holy Spirit's job? To bring back to your remembrance or repeat what God has said. So when you read what God has said in his Torah and his, and his word, the Holy Spirit's job is to echo it back. That's the bot call. That's the bot call. It's the voice of a daughter, gentle, soft voice in metaphor because it's function over form, not the form over function that is focused here. You see, on Sinai, God caused the whole world to be silent in order that mankind might know that there is none beside God. Uh, Yochanan said, when God revealed the Torah, speaking of Rabbi Yochanan, no sparrow chirp, no bird flew, no ox load, the heavenly ophanim, or wheels, moved not, meaning of his chariot. The seraphim, which are a type of angel, did not chant thrice, kadosh, 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 holy, holy, holy. Man spoke not, the sea roared not, the sea roared not, the creature uttered, uh, no creature uttered a sound, and the world was silent while God's voice resounded. I am the Lord your God, ani Adonai. What does that mean? When God's speaking, we're to be silent. God's voice should be louder than any other voice that we hear. When God spoke from Sinai, everyone, let the earth be silent. Our prophecy of Zechariah read, chapter 2, let the earth be silent. The Lord is in his holy temple. When he's speaking, we're to be silent. Be still and know that he is God. But after he speaks, the echo of his voice is the Holy Spirit to keep reminding, reminding, echo, echo, echo. That is the voice of a daughter who keeps saying, Daddy, 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 Daddy. Just like we should call the Father Abba. I love this. It says the bat kol, however, was not the Holy Spirit in his personhood, as the Holy Spirit was understood in the prophetic tradition or linked with the Holy Spirit as portrayed in Christian tradition. In the baptismal scenes in the Gospels, it, it is noted that, the first, that first the Holy Spirit descends and then the voice of God is heard. Read there in Mark three, Mark, uh, Matthew 3, Mark 1, and Luke 3. The same can be said of the transfiguration event in Matthew 17, in Mark 9, and Luke 9. First the Holy Spirit descends, and then the voice speaks. The imagery of the divine voice, or the bat kol, associated with a dove, as found in both Christian literature, is also found in Jewish literature. Did you hear this? Sometimes the imagery of the bat kol is associated with the sound of a dove cooing as related to the story of Rabbi Yosef in the ruins of Jerusalem. Yosef entered a ruin of Jerusalem and re recountered there the prophet Elijah. This is in Jewish tradition that Elijah came up to him in his, in, in his vision, who asked him, my son, what voice did you hear in the ruins? Yosef answered, I heard a bot coal. It murmured like a dove and explained exclaimed, woe unto the children. Meaning because of the disobedience, because of the destruction, because it's happened once to the temple and a second time to the temple. The bot coal still beyond the temple times where God prophetically spoke through prophets with a loud voice, thus saith the Lord. Now there's just the whisper of the Holy Spirit left to say, if you will hear my voice. If you will hear my voice. That's why Isaiah 30 verse 19 says, The people of Zion who are dwelling in Jerusalem will weep no more. They will surely, he will surely be gracious to you. And the sound of your cry, he hears you. He will answer you. Though Adonai gives you bread of adversity, meaning poverty, and the water of oppression, your teachers will no longer be hidden. But your eyes will see your teachers. Your ears will hear a word behind, like a whisper. And you'll hear it behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. 
when you turn to the right or when you turn to the left. Remember, this idea of hearing God's voice, like Hebrews 3, 7, it says, today if you will hear my voice, it was recorded from the Torah, harden not your hearts in the, as you did in the rebellion and on the day of testing in the wilderness. Are you going to hear the devar in your midbar? You got to hear the word in your wilderness. You got to hear today saying through David after such a long time, today if you will hear my voice, do not harden your hearts. For if Joshua had given you them rest when they went in the promised land, God would not have spoken another day on later. So there still remains a Shabbat rest for you and I, the people of God. For one who has entered God's rest has ceased from all his works just as God did from his. This is why seven times in the book of Revelation, the Bible says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Ruach of the Spirit is saying to Messiah's communities to the one who overcomes. You want to overcome this wilderness? You got to hear the, the Spirit of God speaking to you. You got to let him lead you and guide you. You got to let him be your guide. Come on, Mordechai, come at this time. Do you receive this message today? I shared it from my heart. I hope you received it from the heart. Words from the heart penetrate the heart, one rabbi said anonymously. Stretch your hands for the blessing of Numbers 6, 24 through 26, the priestly blessing that we went through just, what, last week? Last week. Priestly blessing. So as you stretch your hands towards heaven, let's believe God for not only his blessings to be upon us. I truly believe that God wants to rest upon us. He wants to give us perfect peace from the Prince of Peace today. Amen. shine his face upon you and be gracious to you and may the Lord turn his countenance towards you and establish peace unto you. From the Prince of Peace, Sar Shalom, Yeshua the Messiah. Amen. Amen. Shabbat Shalom and Shavuot Tov. See you next week.